solve large intractable problems. It's a new venture altogether. Your brain is a wild horse there. Because remember, writing is not a team sport. You are not selling horse carriages when there are cars. I want to be known only as a trusted advisor. More like a tourist. Play to Potential Podcast. Ricardo, thank you so much for making the time to come on the Play to Potential podcast. I've heard uh, so much about you from Vivek Khemka and many of the other colleagues. So it's wonderful to be talking to you. Hi, Deepak. Thank you so much for your time. I've been a fan of Play to Potential and I'm uh, even more, more um, happy to be able to talk to an alumni of the firm. Absolutely. Um, and congratulations on the, on the recently published book, uh, The Energy Advantage. Uh, how's, how's the book doing, Ricardo? I'd be happy to report, Deepak, it's going really well. It's still very early stages because we uh, launched on June 4th. But based on what we're hearing from e-commerce platforms and uh, from brick and mortar uh, mm -hmm. bookstores, it's, all, it's going now all over the place. Um, Wonderful. So... Can't complain. And uh, um, of course, uh, your program, I'm hopeful that it'll help uh, for the uh, continuation of its story. Lovely. Uh, before we discuss the book, Ricardo, I'm curious about uh, the arc of curiosity of people, you know, how they, uh, you know, how they become curious about this topic. Just talk to us a little bit about how this book and even how, how did you become curious about uh, energy? And how did you end up writing this book? You know, I, I think it was at the beginning intuitively. Uh, I wasn't really that much into energy um, about a decade ago. I started to become even more aware and curious of it because um, I was very keen to try to help leaders change. And um, when I started to understand what holds them back, uh, their belief systems and sometimes, you know, their, their emotional systems, their fear systems, you start to realize that there's something stuck uh, in them that until it shifts, uh, you really won't be able to unlock the potential uh, that they are longing to achieve and they're longing to meet. As you're starting to learn um, how it feels, you have to feel it to know, to know. Then you start to see that it's not thoughts that are holding people back to shifting um, their mindset. It's, uh, it's shifting their energy that once it starts to move, once it starts to go from stock to unstock, they are able to actually truly change their personalities. So uh, yeah, you start to become very curious. Um, what is this thing about energy and, um, uh, what are the different kinds of energy that we all human have? Uh, so I'm starting to then to start to become curious about Eastern philosophies and our Western culture and, uh, how to be able to create a bridge between one and the other would be able to help connect the four buckets of energy that we have as humans, um, I was experiencing very clearly the mental and the physical energy, the thinking and the mm. doing, which all leaders are experts on. They've trained themselves for many years and they become very successful. Um, however, there's a compartmentalization uh, depending on cultures and depending on the organization uh, on when it comes to integrating emotions into the workplace or the emotional energy. I started to see as something essential for leaders to be able to then not just um, continue to be more happy in what they do, but also to be able to thrive given the, how the world's changed. Uh, you know, before it was a complicated world. In a complicated world, we set direction and leaders, uh, you know, leaders set direction and people execute. But the world's no longer uh, com complicated, it's complex. Mm. And in a complex world, you need to 
shape context, as Professor Linda Hill says, you know, very clearly in her book, Collective Genius. And um, to be able to shape context, you need to change the way that you lead. You need to become more vulnerable. You need to start to integrate emotionality. Um, and, and however, to integrate the heart, it's not easy to do in a world that uh, believes that integrating heart into the workplace makes you look weak. So there, you know, there's years where spirituality comes in, and I talk about this in the book, has nothing to do with religion. It's one's journey to be able to connect to your original energy, and that makes a stronger heart. Hmm. And when a stronger heart uh, has the right uh, qualities, then nothing can stop it. And then it allows for the right integration of the four energies, the thinking, the doing, the feeling, and the being, um, to be able to create humane leaders. Um, I needed to start to become very curious on each of these different buckets of energy, how to be able to work with each, how to be able to integrate each in a responsible way. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the course of you know, these last 10 years, you end up uh, integrating these and starting to first experiment with clients who were courageous uh, along with me. Um, and now I feel very comfortable that this is the way to, uh, to be able to help, again, leaders be not just even more successful, but happier anytime, mm. anywhere, at work and at home. Lovely. And I want to pick up on what you said about uh, Professor Linda Hill uh, in the yes. book. You say that leadership today is much more about shaping context than setting direction. Can you say yes. more? It's, it's, uh, again, there's a lot yeah. that's uh, sort of packed into that sentence, but I'm curious. If yes, you there's, of, there's uh, a lot, um, a lot on that. I, I remember, and I quoted in the book when I was, uh, having a workshop, uh, with Linda and we were having this with Jane Frazier at that CD group and Jane was taking copious notes when she was actually saying, yeah, this, uh, mentioned it about shaping context. And I asked Jane, why are you taking all these notes? Mm. And, uh, and she said, uh, you know, this is the kind of leader that I want to be. And that's uh, the first time that I hear this term, uh, and, be, and to your point, I want to become more curious about it. Um, shaping context allows, uh, basically what it means is that, uh, a leader can feel very comfortable in saying, I don't know. And, uh, when this kind of vulnerability you can enable psychological safety in the organization. When mm. there is psychological safety, uh, people will trust you more. They will share more information with you so you can co-create together. When you can co-create together, you can enable um, the future in your organization. Um, you can realize what you can do and we can, and what you cannot do, um, you are able to create experiences together, um, that are not possible by one leader alone. Uh, and with that, you can change the environment in which the company, you know, um, performs and you change the context, uh, that your organization, um, is growing and thriving. Am I, am I answering your question? Yeah, 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 I hear you. Uh, actually, as a matter of fact, uh, Amy Edmondson was on the podcast as well, where we sort of spoke about psychological safety in depth. So that's a yes. term uh, that resonates. Uh, I hear you. It's about setting the right climate and sort of, I mean, another person I spoke to spoke about the mindset of a farmer rather than a machinist. So you sort of create the right soil, create the right conditions, and then the crops will flourish and the outcomes will come rather than yes. push, push, push. Totally right. You create, you create, um, in the system, you create the conditions for the energy to flow. And when you're in the zone, you connect to the creative power of the system, the leaders and its teams through that, in that place, not only you can lead from that place, you can create from that place hmm. and from that place, you can change the context in which your organization lives and thrives. Let's get into the book, uh, Ricardo. Uh, your book centers around seven levels of the human energy field. Uh, yes. You say the first four are physical, emotional, and mental, and the next three are spiritual. Just sort of uh, give us a sense of the architecture of 
how you think about human energy and also this term human energy field. You know, I've studied these terms in the physics textbooks, but it was interesting to sort of use the energy yeah. field being used in the human context. Uh, well, I, I, as you can imagine, connecting to your question on how I got curious about energy, one of the areas that I started to explore is uh, the human energy field. I first got to learn about this from my energy teacher, Linda Cesara. Uh, Linda, in, in, in her own unique way, introduced me to the work of Barbara and Brennan. Barbara, she is a former scientist who later became a healer, uh, you know, answering to her true calling. Mm -hmm. When I started to learn about uh, the human energy field, which in other parts of the world can be known as the aura. Um, she started to realize that each of these layers, each of these levels has a very specific frequency and governs very specific experiences in, uh, in our lives. If you're able to attune to e each of the different levels of the human energy field, you can start to separate intentionally how you're going to work with each energy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the first layer of the human energy field uh, takes care of physical energy. So, intentionally, what you do is you work with physical energy with the intention to feel pleasure. Why? Because as we were talking about energy, energy gets stuck in the body. So, when you're able to um, start to feel your body, when you're able to feel it with the intention to feel pleasure, you start to awaken the antennas in your body. When you're able to awaken them, you start to then feel the emotions that are going through your body or the emotions that get stuck through your body. So it's essential to awaken the physical energy within your body. If you are tired, if you are restless, if you don't eat well, if you don't breathe well, it's going to be very difficult to connect to the other layers of the human energy field intentionally. So whenever I start a program with my clients, we always start there, breathing and trying to help them integrate, connect well with their body so that they can feel the intake of energy and the outtake of energy hmm. in their bodies. As an example, second level would be a felt sense, uh, the, the love of self. If you um, connect well with your body, you will feel how integrated are you or not with yourself. Um, the gap that we have of love amongst ourselves um, can tell us how self-confident we are, how much we need to prepare or not, or whatever we do. When, I'm, when we're connecting to a love of self, which is layer two, mm -hmm. What I let my clients know is that there is always a gap uh -huh. uh, emotionally. Um, we are born with our hearts completely uh, full and our heads completely empty, as Gabor Mate says. Then life gets in the way. Um, and that's where the short circuit starts. And we start to become um, less aware of our energy. So um, level, level number two, is, is about uh, love of self. When we're able to feel our bodies, we will be able to have greater awareness of how much connected we are within ourselves. Mm -hmm. When we are properly connected, when we are connected and have a healthy relationship with ourselves, then it connects to level three. Level three is clarity of thought. Um, when we are in, in a positive relationship with ourselves, our ability to think amplifies and our clarity of thought allows for us to be able to prepare less, to be able to um, create more um, and the flow of energy uh, from the way that we think and we solve things multiplies. Fourth level is about creating a proper and loving relationships with loved ones. So if you can imagine when we're in a positive relationship with the people that we love and that they care for us, we, we don't bring that burden into our thinking. So if we are in positive uh, relationship with us and in positive relationship with them, 
our clarity of thought amplifies incredibly. Imagine if you have an electric blanket and a cushy cushion and you are in a place where everything flows. Sometimes my clients would say, you know, Ricardo, it's like, it's like magic. What's going on? I'm able to think and I'm able to solve things in a way that I never was able to before. I don't need to prepare as much as I need to. When we get to this point, it's what I call the physical realm, uh, mm -hmm. both physical, emotional on level two and level four, and then clarity, clarity of mind. Then it allows for us to be able to connect to the spiritual energy, which you may choose to do or not. Sometimes clients have an issue with, uh, say, with secular organizations. And they will roll their eyes whenever I start to get them connected to spirituality. And I let them know that has nothing to do with, re with religion. It's our ability to be able to reconnect to our original bliss. Um, it's the journey that we go uh, and that we unpack so that if we were to get that energy that we have stuck in our lives, unstuck, and we can connect to that original energy, to that essence that we came to this world, um, as I shared, you know, that um, if we come to this world with our hearts completely full and our heads completely empty, then um, our ability to be able to create comes from a different place, from a place deeper, with, deep, deeper within us. So level five talks about uh, truth, our purpose. How connected are we with why we're here for? And if we can be able to hold the spoken word anytime, anywhere, and we can speak about our truth. As you can imagine, if we are in a good place and relationship within, and if we're in good relationships with our loved ones, we are actually more confident, more stronger for us to be able to speak our own truth anytime, anywhere. And when you are in that place, your ability to connect to your purpose amplifies. Discovering it amplifies. Level six, then it's about to be able to learn how to nourish your inner self. Um, as much as we need to eat, sleep, relax, um, we also need to nourish our soul. So uh, how purposefully are we connected to nature, um, to a sunset, to music? What gets you connected to energies that are essential to us, like gratefulness? forgiveness, hope. And when we're able to do that, then of course, level C completely impacts our ability to feel more caring about ourselves. We can feel more compassionate about ourselves and forgiving ourselves. And then the last level of energy, it's about uh, living um, in understanding the true power of creation. Um, and it is from this place that we can be able to create the most wonderful um, ideas um, as they are connected to the deepest, wisest, wiser sense within. Uh, how to be able to peel this onion differently than the onion. When you peel an onion, the onion center is empty. When we're able to peel the human energy self, what we find in there is our true essence. And every, and every one of us has a true essence and whenever we can find it and we can lead from that place, as some of my clients do, if they chose to go this far, then incredible things can happen. Mm, lovely. That's where you can lead from a place of immense energy. We have unlimited energy and there's only 24 hours in the day. Mm. I'm curious, uh, you know, at multiple levels right now, one, one question that's emerging in my head is, is each level a prerequisite for going one level deeper? In a sense, uh, is it fair to assume that I need to sort of have uh, sort of worked on level one and be in a good place for me to access level two and so on? I'm, I'm guessing there's a sort of a, the way you've sort of stacked them up, there's a certain journey that uh, you take clients through. Yes, yes. Uh, stacking it up just... Um... I'm doing it in the purpose to trying to understand each of them, but it is not a, um, it is not a cascade approach. You can start. In fact, you need to work in all of these layers in, in parallel. 
Um, if you do, you will be able to start to feel your body, then connect to your uh, inner self. And then at the same time, clarity of, of thought amplifies that serves as a resource. And then through love of self, you start to connect deeper with your loved ones. And at the same time, you start to find your purpose, your depth, your truth. You start to use forgiveness and compassion and you start to create. So it, it all starts to, um, it's like a flywheel, hmm. like a flying wheel. Exactly. Um, Got it. Got it. it's just, it's just, uh, to try to make it accessible. Mm -hmm. It was important um, for me to be able to do it in a way that it can be explained in discrete levels and also to make it credible so I could use stories that could make it come to life um, because otherwise it's such an abstract topic True, that it was uh, difficult to be able to explain um, in a small book, which is the intention. Got it. I think one of the pieces you mentioned uh, about feeling the emotion through the body you know, I was talking yes. in this podcast to uh, Jennifer Gavi Berger, who I think also yeah. does a lot of work with Egon Zender. Yes. Um, and she speaks about that, right? She says that very often uh, emotions, we feel them before, you know, our mind thinks of them. Yeah. Um, yes. So can you give us some examples of tuning into emotion through the body? Uh, just for the purpose of listeners, that's, that's, uh, I find that to be very powerful. So if there's a story or two about that, then that would be wonderful. Yes, absolutely. Um, I recently did a talk at the World Happiness Summit in, in London. Uh, there were about a thousand participants and I walked them through a brief meditation in which I invited them to just close their eyes and, uh, through a very small breathing to just visualize and maybe your audience can do the same just to visualize, um, a event in their lives which they were incredibly happy and incredibly grateful for. And once I was able to feel that they were in that moment, I asked them to place the left hand in the part of their body where they actually feel the joy of that event. And Deepak, it was beautiful to watch a thousand people or close to a thousand put their hand in the part of their body where they actually feel that joy. And the, you could see that um, everybody put their hand in different places. It, the heart is not necessarily in the heart uh, when it comes to joy. Some would put it in their head, some would put it in their chest, some would put it in their stomach, some would put it in their jaw. And I invited to do the same to you know, connect an, a, an image of sorrow and sorrow lives in different parts of our body as well. When you know where sorrow is in your body, when you know where anger is in your body, when you know where happiness is in your body, you can start to then know how to connect to the physical feeling of the emotion of each of these emotions, which is very helpful. Tuning in and tuning out of joy and sorrow, it's a choice. One that it's easier to know when you do it through your body, because the mind can play many tricks on us, like Jennifer would say, um, but the body would always speak your truth. Uh, how you're able to help leaders, for example, learn how uh, each of these emotions lives in their body allows for them to be able to then, when the event is happening, it, then you can create freedom of choice. Hmm. Anger, for example, it's a very powerful emotion. When it is not done by choice, it can be destructive. When you do it by choice, you can, for example, create boundaries. And boundary setting in these very big leaders, it's essential for them to be able to create space so then it can be able to um, understand what gives them and what takes energy away and protect their time. Mm -hmm. So these are just simple examples of what do I mean and what you're asking me to, to uh, help the audience understand what do I mean by feeling the emotions or the energy in your body. Got um, it. Yeah. Lovely. Um, 
Another term that uh, intrigued me, or your take on the term, which was sort of uh, thought-provoking, in the book you say that professionalism means acting in ways that take us away from our original personality, from our humanity, and therefore can block access to energy. And I yeah. thought that was a very interesting take on the word. Professionalism is often used in a sort of a, uh, you need to adopt professionalism, it's sort of a yeah. no-brainer kind of a thing when you join the workforce. Yeah but you have a slightly nuanced take on the word. So just talk to us about what you mean here. What I, what I mean by is that sometimes we believe that we need to go through life with a professional persona. Uh, it's a bit of a shield. And then we come with this um, belief that uh, you actually can compartmentalize your life. You can have a shield at work and be professional. And you can take that shield off and be at home and be more personal. Um, one of the things I do, Deepak, when I coach um, my clients is I, I create a, a personal a supporting system. I coach their families too. Uh, that, that's why I can work with a level four of the human energy field. So I coach the spouse, the husband, and the kids. Um, for example, I ask the kids, what? Uh, takes energy away from mom? What takes energy away from dad? And what do you think they answer when I ask them this? Disagreements? Work. A hundred percent of them will say work. Probably more than a thousand of them. I've, I've talked so there's this belief that it's a flawed belief. We actually believe, and there's a spillover between, you know, home and work and work and home. No matter how good we think we are in uh, putting this shield uh, at work or at home. Um, when my clients are able then to understand that this shield actually holds them back to be able to be the balls that can shape context, for example, or the father that could be able to show vulnerability as strength uh, at home, then we start to figure out what is it that's holding them back to take this shield off. Because also that shield is there for a reason. It's not necessarily something that it's part of the culture of the country or part of the culture of the work. It has to do also to complete the answer to your question, it has to do with everybody's story. We all have a story. We all have a wound um, and we are all protecting uh, ourselves to feel how we felt when we decided to protect ourselves and start to creating this shield. It's important to be able to help them uh, discover the original, the roots of this so that they can feel comfortable, again, level two, so that you can start feeling more comfortable about yourself, more confident, more loving to yourself, so that with that level of assurance, you can start to let go of that shield that actually it takes a lot of work. If you can take that off, mm -hmm. then your ability to have more freedom of choice on where you are giving energy and what energy you're willing to give, uh, it's more purposeful. Wonderful. That's what I mean by that. I was touched by the term uh, uh, you said about working with the family, because uh, in the work I do, I very often speak to siblings and spouses and children to gather feedback on the leader I'm working with. And yes. I've pe seen people use the word, uh, the phrase team coaching in the context of coaching the leader and the leadership team. But it's wonderful that you're sort of working with the leader and the family. And that's that's a team as well. That's probably a more important yes. team in, in a lot of ways. Uh, yes. Uh, that's wonderful. That's uh, that's that's something. Uh, that's the first time actually I've heard somebody talk about that. Uh, it's very it's very very interesting. How did uh, if, if can you talk a little bit about that? Just that uh, how do you you know carry the family along? Because that, that's the it sort of it seems like a very yes. uh, fresh way of thinking about driving change. And you know, it, when you start to get into the story of um, of each person. Each has a unique struggle in their lives. All these big leaders, they all gone through struggles, which is why they're so resilient in, in, in their ability to take so much responsibility and still be functional and, and thrive and feel. 
um, as I started to go deeper into the story, it's, it's quite difficult to help a very successful person change how to find the right hook, a loving hook. And I started to realize that many of these leaders, they're not, they weren't that in need to change for their companies, but for their families, they would do anything. So when you start to see um, how much the words of a loving person, how much an insight, give you one example. Um, I was recently talking to one of the daughters of one of my clients and um, she actually told me that um, I asked him, uh, when you're walking with your dad during the weekend, just give me an example of what he does and who's your dad. And he said, well, my dad's an artist. And he is, he runs a very big, big organization. It's like, tell me more. Yeah, my dad's an artist. Uh, when he's with a camera, he's able to find the most beautiful things and designs, and he can create the most beautiful photographs. I was like taken so much by this insight, um, which is seen by the eyes of the daughter. And then um, when I spoke to him and I told him, um, can you bring the photographer to work? And like, why do you mean? Because according to your daughter, you can find beauty in everywhere you go. And as he started to realize and discover how to bring the photographer into the office, rather than sometimes, you know, certain rigidity in his way of solving things, he kept, of course, his ability to structure and solve things because that's a superpower. But he started to see more beauty that was compartmentalized in a weekend and started mm. to bring it home uh, in, mm. and started to bring it to the workplace. Um, so that those were the things that you, when you start to connect through this hook, then you start to see that it's a, it's a beautiful um, connection that allows for people to change because they are inspired, because they are, they feel loved because they, then it takes a lot of the burden and the threat of the pain that you have to go through to be able to change because uh, there's no shortcut. You, you always have to feel the emotion that made you close in the first place, which is not joy nor love. But if you can do it um, in, in a non-threatening way and then with the intention to help become a better father or a better mother and as well a better leader, um, I, just, I just found that it's, uh, again, it's level four connects with level two and then level three um, amplifies and you're starting to connect more with your energy and you're allowing yourself to get that stock energy to be um, on stock. Let's, I, I want to go back to the spiritual dimensions, uh, Ricardo. Uh, we, when we hear about the physical, we hear about the emotional. I think yeah. the spiritual, as you rightly said, very often A, it's confused with religion and yes. B, it's often seen as a, you know, in a, in a highly ra rational space, like in the workplace, spirituality is often seen as uh, something that's irrational, something that's not yes. scientific. Can you just sort of uh, bring it to life for us, just maybe just that spiritual dimension, those three levels, and how that can unlock uh, significant value uh, for leaders and organizations and communities? Yes. Um, I guess the, the, the one that's the most difficult to go through it's, it's level five. So maybe I go there um, mm -hmm. and I'll try to simplify. As I was sharing, level five is about um, embracing the spoken word. Is the power of the spoken word when you're speaking your truth. Um, I'm constantly asked, so what is your truth? And we all have a purpose in life. Each one has a different purpose. When you are connected to your purpose, it serves like an energy compass. You know when you are aligned to your purpose or you're in the right path of discovering your purpose because then you get energy in everything you do, mostly. You know when you're misaligned to your purpose because you feel that you're losing energy in everything you do. So it's good to re you know, uh, recalibrate your, your course. As you're starting to get closer to your purpose, my purpose in, in life is to um, connect 
leaders to their energy and become more humane. If you go deeper to it, my purpose is to elevate consciousness. So then uh, knowing that is very helpful um, for me to avoid any noise or unnecessary noise in my life's journey. Um, from that place, I can speak my truth. I can write a book. I can declare what for me is truth or not, which doesn't mean that I'm right or wrong. Just allows me for me to be able to give a point of view that I can share very openly with my clients. And then it's my client's choice to take it, to take it or leave it. But then I can hold confidently a space where I don't feel dependent on the other. And I, I can share very openly in period of service, my truth, which is connected to my purpose. Every system has a purpose. Every person has a purpose. When you're able to connect from that place and you can speak from your truth, then um, you start to become coherent. Your, and there starts to become coherence between your head, your heart, and yourself and your essence. When you are not in that place, there is dissonance. It's like a radio station. Maybe you are 88.1 and maybe I'm 96.5. When you are connected to 88.1, whenever you feel that, when you you feel you're in the zone when you're there, almost like you hear music coming and you can't believe that you were able to jump that high or, you know, hmm. make that result. It's like you're almost like a superhuman when you're there. Rarely where we, we are in 88.1 or 96.5, how to be able to sustain it. That's how it starts to help us to have this compass. Of course, coherence from that place allows us to be able to be in a good relationship with ourselves, level two. We need to be at the right physical and connection to our felt sense, level one. And it allows us to be able to have good relationships with our loved ones. When we are in that place, we're in coherence. But it's now a different dimension of coherence, if that resonates. Got it. Um, when you are from that place, you get access to all these different spiritual energies, um, compassion, which is what we're talking about in level six. It's gratefulness. Um, when I'm able to be compassionate with myself, then I can start to be in a better relationship with myself. I can be able to start myself to get myself out of the way. I can be able to get my story out of the way so I can be in better service for others. Um, when I'm able to be grateful and when I use gratefulness as a way of waking up in the morning, for example, um, uh, how do you connect to this nurturing of the soul of the essence of yourself um, is through level six. Um, it's very good to be able to get to that kind of level because it's very, it's what I call the resource. It's the resource that connects you to your ability to be able to be in a good relationship with yourself level two or with your loved ones on um, level four. The last one, uh, it's also complicated, not as simple as level six. You get access to six by being in coherence with level five, but then level seven takes you to a different level, which is being in, in alignment with the perfect power of creation. Um, from that place, you can create incredible things, but you need to be in, um, in alignment with things that would be very difficult for people sometimes to understand unless you're in a place. Like I quote in the book that imperfect is perfect. Uh, I was advised by many people to take that out of the book and because I wanted to be coherent with my truth, I decided to leave it in the book because I know that sometimes imperfect can mean horrible things for people and saying that those horrible things are perfect. It's not the intention of what I say in the book, but it's the intention to know that we are imperfect as human beings and as such, we're perfect. We cannot love if we weren't imperfect. We wouldn't mm -hmm. learn how to love if we weren't imperfect. Um, and by that imperfection, we learn how to love, which gives us the most beautiful emotion there is. 
So there is a connection there. And from that place, we can actually allow ourselves to give ourselves a break. We don't hold ourselves to levels of inhuman imperfection. And when we're able to let ourselves and we cut ourselves a break, we can let go of things. We can take more risks. We can allow for creativity to go to different levels that unless we are afraid of failure or control, um, it is essential to be connected to this place, which is deep, deep, deep within us. And from that place, then we don't feel lonely. Um, we can fail from that place and learn from that place. Um, no matter how unfortunate the circumstances are in our life, we always have this ability to be able to, um, yeah, learn that there's no, uh, that there's never too late to have a happy childhood, for example. Um, that's, that's a wonderful way of putting it. Never too late to have a happy childhood. That's, yes. that's such a wonderful phase. The one piece I wanted to pick up, Ricardo, was uh, on purpose. You know, uh, yes. the other school of thought or uh, when I, uh, as I'm trying to learn and understand uh, what that means, one line of uh, thinking says purpose is emergent. In a sense, you walk a path, you try a few things and slowly you discover your purpose. Uh, yes. So when I read your book, I got a sense that purpose can be sort of discerned in the sense if you get in touch with yourself, you will get to know the essence. Yes. So I just wanted to sort of maybe understand. Uh, in my head, I was trying to reconcile the two as I was reading your book. W would you have a view on that? I do. Um, as you can imagine, you experiment to try to get to, to what your purpose is. And uh, at the beginning, I was being very uh, process driven, very you know, logical about it. I would, you know, hear this, you know, write an obituary and, uh, you know, or what are the five things that you would like from people to hear or say about you when you die and then compare it is like you, you do all these things, all, all of the right intention for sure. Um, but it is when you connect to this level of spirituality and it really hit home. Um, and I give this example in the book because I, I asked permission to Sander, this sage friend, Sandra Teiterman, uh, I first experienced the Purpose Quest ritual that, that he learned um, um, from, a, from, from, I believe it, that he learned from, a, uh, from monks, um, a, and, uh, which they do as rites of passage. Mm -hmm. When you do the quest in, and you connect to yourself uh, by allowing yourself to be in nature at its best, and uh, you even create space for you to be able to be alone by yourself and you allow for essence and unconsciousness to be able to surface. And he has this very, very witty way of finding words. Um, and then you collect those words, whether when you're starting the journey or in the middle of the journey or when you're in stillness in nature and then when you come back. And then you're able to distill those words to the point that uh, the intention is to start to write a haiku, uh, this Japanese poem, uh, five, seven, five syllable. And um, when you write this haiku, but with the intention to discover your purpose as a part of your journey, of this quest, you are awed by what you're starting to find about uh, what you're truly here for. You feel it. Uh, you know, what's why she, it's very important to do level one first, because you then you start to feel all these things. And then when you feel them, it's that, okay, maybe if I'm feeling this grounded with this, you know, like thunder of energy going through my body, when I am speaking about this haiku, then maybe there's some truth in it, which speaks to me. Um, it is in you. And then when you start to live it, and then you start to work on it and live it again, and you go through your journey, then you start to know. That this is why you're here for. It took me years to get there, uh, and I'm by far not there. Um, but I think I'm in the right direction because every time I do um, what uh, I believe it's my purpose, um, I go to bed happy and I wake up happy. Um, mm. For example, Lovely. Um, when leaders declare their haikus when I take them to the to this quest, sometimes they have them printed in their desk. And whenever they are the thickest, the thickest, 
they can read it out loud and then remind themselves so why they're doing what they're doing. I think uh, the other piece, very tactically speaking, I think uh, you speak about different breathing exercises for us to sort of get in tune with ourselves. And yeah, I I've done the Sudarshan Kriya as part of the Art of Living Foundation, and I found it very powerful. Whenever I did, yeah. it, I must confess, I've not been as regular as I would like it to be. You speak about the Wim Hof method and box breathing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the role of, let's say, breath and breathing exercises and sort of, uh, and how it sort of maps to some of, some of your work? Yeah, I, um, at the beginning of, uh, chapter, uh, the, the chapter of, um, a, of level one physical energy, uh, one of the key things that I say is you center your body through breathing, hmm. you center your mind through silence, you center your emotions through acceptance and you center your body through breathing. Uh, when you're able to do this, then you get access to self. That's why breathing is, is so important. Um, it connects you, uh, to your body and it allows for your body to get out of the way. Um, I like the Wim Hof method, um, because of, uh, the resetting that it does in your body. If you do it well, and if you do it consistently, it, what it does is you start to feel your body and the emotions locked into your body pretty quickly. The hyperventilation that goes through the exercise, which by the way, has a map. You can download the app. You can follow the app. Just what's make the app sure called? That you're doing. What, Sorry? What's the app? What is the app called? Or I, I think it's uh, the way that it's called is a wing, wing hop. Uh, Wim, Wim Hof, Hof. Okay. Got method. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you, we'll do. you download it and. Um, just be mindful that at the beginning, when you start doing it, the hyperventilation can get you a bit nauseous. So just open your eyes so that you go, go back to your head and just call colors. And then you start to train yourself to be able to do it a bit more. Also, there's one part of the exercise where you first hyperventilate and then you let go of the air so that you can then hold without breathing. Mm. Um, not a competition. The more you do the more you will be able to hold without breathing. And the intention is for you to be able to stress the body when you do. Interesting. So that as you stress the body, as you center it through these breathing exercises, and then you're able to do the resetting, you will start to be more aware of your senses, um, which is an essential practice. Um, the other thing that I do is it's important to set an intention to everything you do. Uh, Meditation without intention allows for you to be able to, um, as I say, silent your mind. But yet, uh, when you clear the thoughts, it's good to be able to have one intention as to why you're doing what you're doing. So I always set uh, for, for level one when you're breathing to set the intention of feeling pleasure. So you're, all, you're doing all of these so that you can connect to your senses and through your senses you can experience more of life and that allows you to be able to feel more the good the bad and the ugly uh, which is part of life and that allows for you to be able to create the foundation for what's next breathing is super important to be able to oh, do correct it. and how when do when do you do this uh, in the day wim hof method is it in the, the morning day? okay yeah I, I do it in the morning um you end up at it reaches at the beginning at your point, and I love that you say, let's go tactical, because it feels a bit, a bit mechanical at the beginning, which is true, but it reaches a point where it becomes very natural to you. So there are moments where uh, at, right after, b before a call or a meeting or something that I know it's going to take, for example, some energy away from me, I just immediately, I just breathe and I, I connect. And, uh, and that allows me to be able to be present and aware of what's coming, uh, through my body, not just my mind. Got it. Got it. Moving to a different theme, uh, Ricardo, um, in the book, you speak about self-limiting beliefs, right? And I think, uh, you speak about, uh, I think your early years and you speak about being a people pleaser and how that was a self-limiting belief. And personally, given my upbringing and given how I was brought up, I could relate to it for a long time. I've been given the feedback, you know, you could be more assertive, you could sort of make your points more forcefully, you know, you could make your presence felt a bit more, uh, you're too soft. 
Uh, yeah. And I think it's it's a journey, as you say. It's still a work in progress. Yeah. And in a way, I've tried to solve for it. Even if I go back to search, you know, this would show up around the closing phases of a search, where you need to you need to be assertive yeah. with the client and the candidate to to close the the search. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, how your work, uh, you know, sort of helps people deal with self-limiting beliefs and going past them. Yes. Um, self-limiting beliefs um, are a, a, one of the biggest holdbacks for, for leaders in the world, um, mostly because our caretakers trained us to face our fears, conquer our fears, but they never told us that we should also question and update the beliefs that they've been given to us. Mm. Um, so they are very much ingrained into our unconscious. Discovering what those self-limiting beliefs are, it's tricky. Um, but when you do, and working with the families helps a lot. So uh, asking, you know, the kids or the wife or the husband, uh, you know, when dad says, this is who I am, what does he say? Um, or when he tells you what to do or not to do, how he sa- what he says and what does he say? Because he is just reflecting a mirror of his belief or her belief system. Now, updating the belief system is the tricky part, not just discovering it. Why? Because when you do, a part of you unconsciously has a um, invisible loyalty you would feel that you're betraying the people that you love that originally gave you this belief and that you held, you're held as truth as part of your rule book back in very early stage in your life. Connecting to the original intention as to when they gave you those beliefs. I ask my clients, what do you think was the intention of your caretaker of mom and dad when they gave you those beliefs? Say, they want me to be happy, successful. So then connect to that original intent so that when you're updating the system, you're not betraying mom or dad. You're actually updating it to honor their wish for you to be happy and successful. That's wonderful. When this happens, it really liberates the ability to be able to update because we're not talking about principles or values. Those are untouchable and I'm not there to get into any of those. However, because of what we spoke, the world has changed. And unless you are able to update the belief system, then as a leader, you won't be able to shape context or become uh, vulnerable or find strength in vulnerability or even be open to the idea that I could be my own self anytime, anywhere, and I don't need to compartmentalize work and home. When you're able to make these updates, you find in them immense amount of energy that you're able to unleash. And what I also love is in a way you're updating your operating system while being grateful for the past, you know, by yes. honoring the intent. That's such a powerful thing. Very often, uh, yes. you know, there's an op- we, we end up saying, okay, that was what, that, that was how I was brought up. That doesn't work for me. And there's so f- maybe a, a little bit of a residual, if I may say, negative energy about the people that gave us the operating system. So what I love is you yes. move forward, but with closure and with uh, harmony with the past, which is so powerful. Thank you. Yes, that, that's, uh, that's really the intent. Um, I find that people change with, more with tough love than with just toughness, because uh, then you find the warrior in them and they, are very, they have a very good warrior, which is why they are where they are. Yeah, got it, got it. The other phrase... Uh, I loved uh, in the book, you say, tackling your belief system is not like venturing into a cave to slay a dragon. It's more like having a very tough conversation with a difficult relative who's hiding behind a closed door. It's such a, such a sort of a poetic and a very graphic visual. Talk to us about what you mean here. Um, you know, when you have sometimes inside of you, all these blind spots that to your point are left inside of us with a lot of tender love and care. Um, how to be able to open the door of that closet? Again, it, it comes as a result of finding the right key. And sometimes 
you know, when you have this relative and you can connect to some of these uncles that you love really dearly, deeply, that you admire, uh, or that they became a big influence in you. Sometimes when you're able to bring them along the journey, um, it's easier to be able to open the door than when you bring in, let's say, mom or dad, uh, who you hold in the highest of respects or whatever the emotion is that you may recall. Um, so all these resources allow for you to be able to find these blind spots so you're able to bring the unknown to the known. And you can choose to make it a fight and see in that updating a dragon, or you can choose that they were there with deep care and the intention for you to be successful, and then just connect to that um, energy. And um, the updating will allow for gray areas because we're not trying to get rid of the belief. It's how can you amplify your definition of success? How can you amplify your definition of um, pain or control or perfection? So we're not trying to get rid of everything. It's just if you can update it in a way that works for you now, you can keep your edge and at the same time be caring. You can be candid and at the same time be loving. How you're able to balance this, it's, it's a choice. And very often with beliefs, what I've noticed is it's a bit like uh, fish in the water, right? Uh, the fish doesn't realize it's swimming in water because sort of water feels like air for the fish. So in yes. your experience, how do leaders, how do you even recognize that you have a self-limiting belief that's holding you back? What's, what's been your experience with just even bringing that to people's awareness? Yeah. I mean, when you're starting to discover uh, what's your, what are your beliefs? Um, right. Um, as I shared this example with a, with a caretaker, uh, with a, with a family. Um, uh, and then you started to see that there's this, this is, so you first start asking yourself this question this is who I am. Now you can start to ask once you get that list, how much is this belief serving me today? Or how much is this belief holding me back to where I need to be or where I, or who I want to be? And then you start again back, you connect to your truth. And then you start to feel if this belief is actually serving you or not. This is not something logical. This is something that you need to feel. And then you start to see if my dad, when I was being raised, told me, Ricardo, men don't cry, which I hold in a deep belief very dearly. And then my first boss tells me, you know, Ricardo, don't let them see you cry because if they do, they're going to eat you alive then you start to realize that when you do that, in, in reality, you, you are shutting your emotional system down. Now, when I start to ask myself these questions and I start to see, you know, men do cry, we do cry. That doesn't mean that we're going to cry endlessly or women endlessly um, in front of a, you know, our town hall, but I can show emotions when I am touched by something which can make me feel human and when I can connect to the audience um, with, with true emotions, then they see me and I see them. They can feel me and I feel them. Then you start to know that that belief is not serving you right. Mm. And then if you update it and you create this gray space, you start to see that um, by updating it, you become more human um, because now the world's changed. And thanks to this change, you can actually allow yourself to be that way in the corporate setting before you couldn't. Now you do. The other phrase uh, I, uh, I was curious about in the book, uh, Ricardo, is you, you speak about family constellations being yes. a big, big source of breakthrough for your clients. And I think more specifically, one of the questions uh, that really got me thinking was, am I in my rightful place in the family system? You know, you ask people to reflect on it. Can you talk a little bit about family constellations and just what do you mean by the rightful place in the family system and how does that impact our performance and who we are? 
Yes. Um, I mean, this is deeply into level four, which is how to be able to be in good relationships with your, with your, with you and, and your loving, um, mm. caring family. Um, family constellations is a, a, um, framework that was created by a German named Bert Kellinger. Uh, he was a very wise man. Uh, the way that he was able to discover the foundation of this framework was, uh, he was a missionary in, uh, in the Sulu tribe in Africa. Um, he later was able to connect with other tribes in other parts of the world. And he became incredibly surprised that the rites of passage, the traditions were very similar between tribe to tribe without each tribe having any possibility of communication to each other back in the day. So he started to realize that there was a collective unconsciousness that if he was to distill in principle of life, what he started to realize is whenever there is a disorder in these principles, then energy gets stopped. And when you put in order these principles, then energy flows. There's a sense of belonging is the first one. The second one is being in a good relationship. Um, and good relationship is a balance between the giving and the taking. And there's only one exception in the giving and the taking. Uh, which is parents give, children take, and it works very, very well. And then the third one is what you were making reference on, which is how to be able to be in your right place. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if there is a, if there is a balance, a, a disorder in the balance of relationship, and parents, for whatever reason, they start, they start to take from you at a very early stage in your life, you start to play a different role in the family. If for any reason, mom or dad were not available, let's say, for example, emotionally, and you start and you have to start to take care of members of the family, then you start to play the role unconsciously of mom or dad at a very early stage in your life. When you do, you're not in the right order. If you are, let's say, brother three and brother one or brother two or sister one or sister two weren't able um, to play the role of, let's say, the caretaker, because for, any re for whatever reason, you were the one with more resiliency, then if a sibling three, you play the role of, let's say, father or mother, then at a very early stage in your life, you start to get um, miss opportunities in life. You're not able to play. You're not able to take life more relaxed. On the contrary, you start to take life way too seriously at a very early stage in your life. Sometimes this is called parentification. When this happens, then you take these patterns into your adulthood. And you start to play that way when you are a leader of an organization. When you have this disorder, then you will be fathering or mothering your teams in your organization the same way as you're doing in your family system. And then the children or your direct reports will be behaving as children because you're mothering them or fathering them, no matter how senior your direct reports are. When you're able to put in order the energy in the system, and rather than being the mother of the system, you become sister three, or you become the boss of the system, not the mother or the father of the system, then the children get back into place and they start to behave as adults that they need to be behaving. It is fascinating. When you start to put all these things in order, the system gets in order, both the, the individual gets in order. This is a lot, this is also incredibly helpful in family owned systems where the energy, for example, of the father sets the culture of the organization. And sometimes the CEO of the, of the generation to come or, or the CEO from the past generation behaves exactly the same way because the pattern resists and the patterns persist. So one of the rules of family constellation is whatever you exclude, the pattern will repeat. Whatever you integrate, you will be able to transcend. Whenever you're able to put things in order, then you, trans you transcend 
the transgenerational trauma in the system, both in your family system, for example, and also in the workplace. Family constellations in these are incredibly helpful. The dynamics of family systems are the ones who sometimes are placed in question. Whenever I explain the theory, it's like, my God, this is very logical. This is something that if you are able to put in order, I can see that. Or I can kind of like understand what you're saying. It is the dynamics of family constellation that sometimes can put people uh, um, uh, uncomfortable because there are parts of the um, framework and the way that you approach this dynamic. Um, you know, surrendering to the mystery of life sometimes is incredibly helpful. Um, however, when you're able to put in order the, the family and the members of the family in a, um, in a place where it's being held by the facilitator, it's incredible how the unconscious surface. And it's one of the best frameworks that I've seen with the right facilitator that allows for you to be able to identify the root cause as to why you behave the way that you behave. And sometimes the root cause is held in the most unsuspected of places. And when you're able to find then the reordering that happens and the energy that flows is immense and very lasting. Lovely. I'm mindful of time, Ricardo. We could keep going. Just a couple of questions before we wrap up. Again, sure. picking, up, picking up from another phrase that was very poetic. Um, uh, what would happen if you tried to make bread without yeast? You might get something, but it wouldn't be bread. Yes. And uh, you say that spiritual energy is the yeast in the bread of human energy. Yes. Yeah. Talk to us about, about what you mean here. I, I think by being able to talk about that, it's important to, to declare that, you know, um, there's a part deep within us. Some people call it self. Some people call it soul. Some people call it spark. Some people, however you call it. Mm. Um, it's there and, um, getting access to it. Um, it's not easy because again, we were, um, as life struggles go on, it, it, we started to get separated from it. But when we're able to connect to it, whenever you were either 40 or 50, you can do with it far more than when you had full access to it, when you were one. So we need to earn going back to it and get access to it. And when we're able to do, you cannot make bread. You cannot feel alive when you're not have access to it. There's so many leaders that I work that are so successful that when they hire me, they feel a void in their lives. No matter how successful they are, the more success they get, the bigger the void feels. Mm. And it's because in many cases, they are not intentionally reconnecting to that um, energy that's uh, our birthright. And when we are able to connect to it, then it's the gist of life. We can make breath from it. Um, this is something that Again, sometimes life and what happened in our lives um, blocks us from hearing things like this. Whenever I'm able to work with leaders who want to get to that place because the void is unbearable um, or the void just feels like a wonderful opportunity to be able to create more and be able to find a greater place because they feel the calling. Um, that's the gist of their life and that's the gist of who they want to become. Um, when you do, you can create breath. Um, yeah. Lovely. On that note, uh, Ricardo, this, this podcast is titled uh, Play to Potential. And one of the questions yeah. I ask all the guests is, what does the term mean to them? So what does play to potential mean to you? Um, I think the way that I answered last time, the play to potential is when we're able to connect to the deepest, wisest self in all of us. When we do, we have unlimited potential. Mm. We, we know, we feel, we love, we cry, 
we create beautiful things, terrible things. Um, we become human when we're able to integrate uh, all these four beautiful energies that we are born with, our mental, our physical, our emotional, and the sense of self that we're calling spirituality, then you can play to your full potential. Every human has a role. Every human has a purpose. If every human was able to play to its full purpose, we will elevate consciousness in humanity in a way that, um, that yeah, will be unstoppable. Wonderful. That's such a wonderful, optimistic note to end this conversation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ricardo, for being generous with your time. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Deepa, for your questions and uh, how much you prepared it. It felt great and I felt very comfortable. I should mention that the full conversations with all these individuals is available free of cost on Apple, Spotify, and most other podcast platforms. Our mission through this work is to make a difference to as many people as we can by provoking reflection and helping them play to their full potential. However, if you or your friends or colleagues are looking for context-specific nuggets around leadership or transitions, some of my commentary as a coach and a sounding board along some of these themes, cross-referencing with some of the other pieces of content in the podcast archives, hand-edited transcripts, or engage with a tribe of other growth-minded people, you might want to sign in for the membership that will give you access to all this and much more. Thank you.